Hey, everyone. If you love this podcast, can you do me a big favor and please give us a review on whatever platform you're using and tell a friend or family member to subscribe. And speaking of subscribing, that's the best way to keep up because you'll get a notification each time we upload a new episode. So make sure you hit subscribe on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you're feeling generous, appreciative, or perhaps a bit guilty for getting all this free content, haha, go to patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker show and become a member. You'll get free ebooks, early access to the episodes, and a chance to win the occasional free 30 minute coaching session with yours truly. From the magnificent Midwest, it's The Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Hey, everyone. So I'm so excited. I have a guest with me today. Her name is Liz Durham. And she is the host of the Being Different podcast, which I told you about um, a few episodes ago, I think. So make sure that if you just make sure to subscribe to hers, because if you like the Suzanne Becker show, you're going to like Being Different. I mean, just the title alone tells you what you need to know there. Anyway, Liz is a 33-year-old wife and mother of two boys from Knoxville, Tennessee. She's a former mortgage banker who has just quit her very high paying job to stay home with her boys. And that's how she and I came to meet because she sought me out. I'll ask her again exactly how she found me or what was happening because we're going to open up talking about her wake up call and what um, she is now, how she is now looking at things very, very differently than the way she was taught to and the way she was raised herself. So um, really looking forward to this conversation. Hope you guys get a lot out of it. I know you will. And, you know, once again, make sure that when we're, when you're finished listening to this, you check out her podcast, Being Different. Hey, Liz. Hey, Suzanne. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah, glad to be here. So I wanted to start for people, I, what I'm calling your wake up call, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, or if that's not the right phrase, but what essentially happened that made you to so- decide to leave your job to stay home with your two boys who are now what, one and three? Yeah, I have a son and a daughter, Matt, who's I'm three sorry. and, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. No problem. and Charlie, who's one and a half. Um, so I guess it wasn't like a neon sign or a specific moment that I had a wake up call, but over, you know, the first almost three years of my son's life, I was doing the working mom thing. So I was working, you know, 50 to 60 hours a week at some point, um, and trying to be a good wife and trying to be a good mother. And I couldn't, it was like just too much. And I was frustrated by, so many things in life. Like I was frustrated that I felt like I was failing in every area because I couldn't give every area a hundred percent. I felt like I couldn't even give each area, you know, 25 or 50%. And for my personality, that was not acceptable. Um, and so I think where I finally like got really fed up and frustrated was, you know, my husband and I, we kept dealing with, you know, the same issues. It was like this vicious circular cycle. Um, and the childcare was the main one that we were dealing with. And I was just seeing my son's behavior and I wasn't happy with it. Um, you know, he was, we had done nannies. We had had many different nannies. We had done uh, mother's day out slash daycare. Um, we had had different babysitters come in the house kind of on rotation. So I felt like we sort of exhausted like every childcare avenue that we could, Um, and nothing was working. And what was also kind of unique about my situation was I was working from home. And so when we would have these people in our house, um, you know, I would be downstairs working, but I could hear them upstairs or wherever they were. And, you know, if I could hear Mac, like 
laughing or doing something like I would get really upset and almost kind of like jealous in a way, like why I, that should be me up there. You know, I'm missing out on all these things. And so eventually I was not happy with my son's behavior. You know, he had become like kind of aggressive and was just acting out and being bad. And I was sick of being like angry at my husband, but for things that weren't his fault, really. Um, and just unhappy with my life in general. And so that was like about a three year build up. And finally I was like, Luke, we cannot do this anymore. And he was like, then quit. Um, and so that was like a big day for us when he finally, you know, we had like wrestled with all these different things and tried as many things as we could to make it work, doing what we were doing and couldn't. And he was like, just don't, don't do it. And he was like, and if it doesn't work out, you being at home with the kids, then you can always go back to your job or find another job. Like it's not a final thing. Um, but clearly what we were doing wasn't working. So I don't know if there was a wake up call. It was just like three years of built up frustration. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Was the, was there a event at all? Like the very last straw? Not really. Um, I think it was like a culmination of we had eaten Uber Eats way too many nights. We had had so many frozen pizzas. Like we were never getting home cooked meals. And then Mac was getting sick all the time. Plus his behavior. I think it really did change though. When we had Charlie, my daughter, because with one kid, I could still kind of fake it and manage if that makes sense. But with two kids, you can't really. Um, and so that probably was the changing thing, even though I didn't quit immediately when I had Charlie, it was, you know, about a year later. Um, that's probably when it started to really get bad was when we had two kids, not just the one. Yeah. That's exactly how my mom phrased it. She said, by the time the second one came along, forget about it. I'll exactly. Bet. Yeah. And it's kind of how you feel. It's just like, oh, this is just going to be a perpetual disaster. And do I want to live in this? No, I don't. So yeah. we got to do something about it. And really quick, just to back up for a second. The reason why I always say two boys is because you named your girl, Charlie. Charlie. Exactly. Mac, yes. Mac and Charlie. So every, you know, and everyone knows, I do know that you have a daughter and a son. Um, I know. But that's why it, that's because of, because of her name. Um, yes. We gave her the, <laughs> the double name, the good old Southern Charlie Kate, but of course yeah. we don't call her that. So then she just has the boy name. So does sorry, it Charlie. I? Is it-, it does not. We named her after my brother. Actually, his name is Charlie. So it's I E at the end. Okay. So I thought it would be great to use, cause you're, you just remind me so much of me when I was your age, not because of that story. Cause I, you know, I was home from day one and I, my whole outlook pre kid was very different from yours and a different generation, different upbringing and different plans and all that. But in terms of our personalities, we are very similar. I mean, it's very hard to find somebody who is willing to face the music and look inward and say, okay, this isn't right. This is what, what, what am I being taught versus what do I feel? And then really looking at it and making change. I I think that's very difficult. So when I talk about our being similar, that's really what I mean is that you are as honest as I am about what's going on. And there's just no, no pussy footing around. You just kind of get to it. Right. Yeah. But it's not easy. It's very difficult. No, but it's not easy. (laughs) So that's an important caveat. It's like, it's easy to understand and difficult Mm -hmm. to do. And yes. that's important because just because we are more prone to not caring what people think, that doesn't make it easy. It doesn't mean like we just have no problem with this. It just means that right. we're more willing, maybe that's a better word, to go out on a limb. Um, and so I wanted to to talk with you about your experience and and really connecting it to how we raise women today, mm-hmm. which we, you and I both feel is abominable, just complete lies, lies on top of lies. Mm -hmm. And which then causes people such as yourself to have to have this wake up call and create a life that was completely, that is completely opposite of what you had planned. So this transition that didn't need to happen if you had, had been given a heads up. So that's what I really want to talk about. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about this transition and what makes it so difficult. You referred to in your last episode of, of being different. And I already told people at the beginning about your podcast again. So 
they know about it um about yourself about your being a woman in training <laughs> that's how you okay <laughs> that's funny. I love that um so I think for me I have never like labeled myself as a feminist or anything like that. I actually have always appreciated the men in my life and never felt like I was held back by the patriarchy or anything like that. But I think where my issue comes in is that I, whether it be through culture or college, or I don't know when it was, a lot of this indoctrination happened to me. And so I was living this like career woman lifestyle. Um, and if you're going to work like that and you're being trained to perform and act like a man and work, because let's be honest, men are very successful, especially in the field that I was in. I was a loan officer for a bank. Um, you start to develop habits in certain ways of thinking, which I did, that are very dominant. Um, not that that's bad, but if you can't turn that off when you go home and you're in a relationship with a husband who's also dominant, um, it causes a lot of strife. And for me, I think there was like, I don't know if you would say this like underlying power struggle, but that's maybe what it kind of was of like, who's actually in control and, you know, running the show because that's how it was for me in my business. Um, so that a lot of that just came home and, you know, in the, coaching that I've done with you, Suzanne, a lot of what we've been working on is when your husband comes home and there's something that you would typically, you know, argue with or, you know, be combative about, you just say like, okay, honey, or, you know, I, sure, that's fine, whatever. And so ultimately, I think one of the the biggest things that hit home with me that you have taught me is you have to like say in your head over and over and over again, surrender. And that is very hard for somebody who's taught to be a bulldog and mm -hmm. at work, but not just at work. Like you can't separate it from work. It's just like kind of ingrained in your personality after working that way so long in an industry. And so if you can't take that out of your relationship, you're going to remain like at war with your spouse or in competition at least. Um, and that's not good. So I recognize that. And I am still very much who I was trained to be in my job and just my personality, who I am. I'm still that person. So retraining myself has been pretty difficult. Um, and it's something that like, it's not going to happen overnight. And I recognize that, but like, it just takes practice like anything else. Like I used to play basketball and to get any better, you just had to practice over and over again. So I'm trying to practice it. And that's what I meant by I am a new woman in training, I guess you would say. I'm still the same me, but trying to do things differently. And I love how there's really two aspects to us because this is to this, because this is really about marriage and motherhood combined, yeah. right? Like what mm -hmm. if, so you're talking right now about um being a wife and the work that we've done together, which is great. But there's also this other piece, of course, to this conversation which is the motherhood piece, the mothering, let's call it a verb, mothering, not mm -hmm. just having children, but actually mothering them. Yeah. And talk to us about what you're experiencing today versus the first three years and what you've learned on that front that you didn't perhaps know before. Yeah. So I um, was lucky enough. I had a mom who stayed at home with us. She was a full-time stay at home mom. She actually even like homeschooled us. So she was very involved in our lives. So I had a good example in my life of a mother who was connected to her kids and had, you know, good, strong attachment with us, all of that. Um, but for me, you know, I decided to go the work route and try to conquer the world and I was doing pretty good at it. Um, and then I had kids. And so I had this crisis of like, oh, I, I didn't know or think that I would like being a mother as much as I do. And I think that's what a lot of women encounter. Like they may think, oh, you know, one day I'll, I may have kids or something like that, but it's almost an afterthought. And that's probably how it was for me. Um, and so when I was working and I was constantly relying on, you know, other people for childcare, I was absent, you know, during, you know, the majority of every day, you know, I was working. Um, and so I didn't develop the secure attachment with my son, Mac, because 
I wasn't there. And my biggest mistake with him was having so many different forms of childcare because he didn't have any consistency in expectations or discipline or even food, like nutrition, anything like that. It was just kind of like a, how, what are we going to do to survive today so I can get my job done? Um, and the parenting part, although it was very important to me, was always kind of an afterthought because the, I was doing my job first. And then, you know, I'd have him when I was done doing my job at the end of the day, which was not very many hours. And so when I switched to being full time stay at home mom, now I'm with him all day long. And it's and now I've got to learn how to be a stay at home mom. That's not something that just like, you know how to do. I mean, there are a lot of things that are innate that mothers are good at. We're more naturally nurturing than men are, but um, it's not something that you just know how to do. So I'm learning how to do that, but I'm also learning a lot. I care about like, why are we doing the things that we're doing? And is it just because our parents told us to, or society tells us to, or is it actually what your kid needs? And so I'm trying to learn a lot about like childhood development and what actually happens in these stages of life. And so, you know, part of what I've learned is that, you know, Mac was not securely attached to me. And that's probably why we're having a lot of these issues with him not being able to regulate his emotions and deal with things because I wasn't there this first three years of his life. So that's been not only a big transition for the kids, but a really big transition for me, um, because it's like speaking a new language. Like I, I was a banker. I am fluent in numbers and interest rates and risk and all that. But like being fluent in how to parent a child in the right way is it's not something you just know how to do. So it's not definitely a transition. In the slightest. In fact, um, I would say that's true of both marriage and motherhood. And we're going to come back to that in a second. Um, because it's just so funny how that really takes over for most of us are, you know, the bulk of our lives. And yet we're completely, um, uh, uneducated about in that area whatsoever, which yeah. was not the case 50 years ago. I mean, women were, they were groomed to be wives and mothers, right? Right. And that might've had its own, uh, complications or whatever, but now we are completely gone in the other direction where we're groomed to be career women and have no idea what we're doing on the front home front. Mm-hmm. Um, so and it's even Suzanne, yeah. like stupid stuff. Like I, I can't cook, you know, like, yeah. like I, sh- I should be able, like last night we were making a uh, Salisbury steak and Luke was like, all right, I don't know how to make the gravy. Like you make the gravy part. And I was like, I don't know how to make brown gravy. And I'm like, I'm 33 years old. I should probably know how to make brown gravy at this point in my life. And so it's I- like dumb stuff like that. Yeah. And not dumb, right? Not dumb at all. Like so crucial because that has this domino effect on our, not only our health, but our children's as well, yeah. and not being raised with proper nutrition and all that. So it's, what's interesting about your story is that you had a stay at home mom and you were, you had home cooked meals. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you had all of that and still represent, you know, the average modern woman today, that's just proof of how strong the culture is because presumably you're, your upbringing would, unless you want to talk about, I don't know if you want to get into this because I know your story, but you know, what you saw there that you didn't want and maybe you overcorrected. I think that it's common. I don't know if it's like just females, but I I know a lot of people that, you know, they do the opposite of what their parents have done. So it's like almost you take for granted what you had and you overcorrect in the opposite direction. It's not that my parents necessarily did anything wrong or anything like that. I was just like, oh, well, you know, we didn't grow up with a lot of money or anything like that. So I went in the opposite direction. But I was also reading this thing the other day that said that a a child really gets their, like, who they are going to be as an adult between the ages of 16 and 20. And for me, you know, I was, you know, and at the end of high school and in college during those years, my mom wasn't homeschooling me during those years. And I remember vividly, like I took, you know, female studies classes and, you know, all the English classes at University of Tennessee, which were very, you know, feminist minded and stuff like that. And so I can't help but think that like, even though I had my parents who did, you know, raise me in a good way and everything like that, it I feel like that definitely had more of an impact on me than I would have thought that it did at that time. I think that is incredibly common. And I, I, I completely agree. Cause you really, 
unless you have conversations, I had a very, very unusual upbringing in this respect, and we're not going to get into that, but that, the average family isn't going to be discussing these issues no. you know, growing up. You're just not. So, so the only real, what you call education you're going to get is what you get in college. And we right. all know what that looks like, like, as you just said, so that's just a shit show. Okay. So, um, exactly. So you had Erica Komisar on whom I love. Yes. She's and, awesome. Yep. And people who've been uh, listening to the Suzanne Becker show for a while know that I've had her on, I think total of three times already. So um, you were able to really get into um, a lot of sensitive issues there. And I, I um, last week did, if you didn't catch it, did an episode on daycare mm-hmm. and I, and, and you talked about that with her as well on yours. What do you know now that you didn't see then about daycare? Yeah, daycare is a touchy one. Um, So we, I'm trying to remember exactly when we started Mac in daycare. He was like two, I believe. Um, Maybe like at the end of his first year, beginning of two years old. Um, And so my first biggest frustration with it was he was constantly sick. Um, so the selfish part of me that was, you know, needing childcare to work for me so that I could work and do my job. I was like, so not only am I paying for this daycare for him to go to that he can't go to because he's sick all the time and then he's coming home and I can't work either. But like, I don't know, that was a big frustration to me. And I was like, yeah, you know, of course he's going to be sick because he's around all these snotty nosed kids that are licking these toys. And like, it's, Mm -hmm. it you know, duh, that's just going to happen with little kids. And so you're asking for it. And I know that some people don't have an option, but you know, for us, we did. So that was just kind of stupid on my part. Um, but you know, the real issues that I've had with daycare is I feel like in our society, there's no, like people can't discipline kids anymore. Um, and so also you're putting a little child who's under the age of three in a setting with tons of kids with few teachers and it puts a ton of stress on the child. Like that's not how it's meant to be. They're supposed to be, you know, with one-on-one care or at least, you know, less than that, maybe two or three. Um, And so you're causing all this stress to your child who can't tell you what they're feeling or anything like that. And then they act out or they either shut down is what I've observed. And my child was the one acting out because he was learning bad behaviors from other kids at school. Um, and they couldn't discipline him because of DCS and, you know, all these laws that we have now. Um, not to mention the fact that you can't discipline a child who's not yours. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and a teacher can do a basic job in the classroom. Yeah. I mean, an actual classroom, not daycare, but yeah. you have to form that bond first for them to respond to you. Right. But they couldn't even like, if they were fighting, they couldn't even put them in timeout or anything like that. And so for me, I was just like, what is going on here? So then you're trying to like talk to your kid and tell them how to behave at daycare when they're two years old. Like, come on, give me a break. They can't understand that. Like you can't tell them like, okay, this is when it's okay to hit someone in self-defense. And this is when it's aggression. And (laughs) they don't get it. They're two years old. Um, and so eventually I was just like fed up with, you know, okay, well, did Mac do good today or bad today? Or what are we going to deal with? And eventually I was like, every time I pick him up and I bring him home, I feel like I'm trying to retrain him out of these bad behaviors. And it's just like, what what are we doing here? And now I understand, like after reading Erica's book and a lot of other research, like kids don't need socialization under the age of three. All they do is parallel play anyways, for the most part. And so the lie that we get, which everybody told me, oh, he needs to be socialized with other kids. Oh, he needs that. It's BS. They don't need that. Um, What they need is they need secure attachment with, you know, a figure that's presumably or hopefully the mother, but if not, you know, a family member or someone else. Um, And so that's where, once I read that book, I was like, yeah, it makes sense. Like to me, I was seeing all of the symptoms of the issue, but I didn't know like what the root cause is because society tells us, no, they need this. This is good for them, but it's not. And so now, and the reason I wanted to focus on this is here you are again, now you're having to transition 
and mm-hmm. the work with Mac now that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of doing to yes. counteract what happened. This is another example of um, what doesn't need to be if women had the information they're entitled to have about marriage and motherhood and raising children and all the rest. You mm-hmm. wouldn't have to be in this boat. And that's why you're here today. Cause I want to use you as an example of, yeah, it's going to work out for her. Yeah. She's, she's great. She's going to do it. But why should she, you even said this yourself in your last episode, why should it have to be this hard? Why don't we just omit this whole 10 year experiment and just start from the get go? Right. I, that's where my frustration is, is I'm like, I just wish someone would have told me like, you can choose this route that you're choosing now of going down this career path and trying to do it all. And all these things that society says that we can and should do, um, or you could do it this other way. And if you do it this other way, it's going to have a lot less consequences, consequences and be a lot easier on you and your children. And so then I'm like, well, if I would have known both of those options, Maybe I would have chose the option that I'm doing now. Maybe not. I was really stubborn back then. Maybe I wouldn't have, but I just, I feel like we need to have information and we need to know what's, what's going to happen. Amen. And we're going to conclude today talking about um, that exact thing. I'm going to read something from Jordan Peterson's book, Beyond Order, the one that came after 12 Rules for Life. And he has a whole chapter in there. Um, It's actually on the romance chapter, believe it or not, but that's where he was talking about this same issue and and i'm he does a great job of explaining in this one paragraph um what i'm basically trying to to get across to women as well that there's a different way of doing this but we'll get to that in a minute okay so um let's let's go back to the marriage issue Mm -hmm. i think that part and parcel of this not preparing women for motherhood is also not preparing them for marriage yeah and gosh there are a lot of reasons for that I mean, on the one hand, this wasn't your story or my story, but the average, not the average, sorry, at least half of the people today who are married are products of divorce. Yeah, sad. I think it's shocking that we think that something as complex as living with someone for the rest of our lives, day in and day out, would come somehow naturally. Yeah, or easily. (laughs) Or easily. Or that we were going to just know how to do it when we literally had no model for how not to do it. Like, right. what sense does this make, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, marriage is falling apart. I mean, as an institution, because you basically have the blind leading the blind. And I think a lot yeah. of previous, uh, the previous generation didn't do, for, if anything, they're, they're encouraging their daughters in particular not to get married until way later in life. Like it's a la- it's a last ditch um, not last ditch, a last uh, afterthought. That's the word I was going for. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the research has just actually shown that Pew, the Pew research came out just a couple of weeks ago, showing that um, parents are 88% of parents are um, prioritizing money and career over marriage and family. Yeah. It's sad. There you have it in a nutshell. And you wonder why, why things are falling apart for women. It's because of the way they were parented. I believe that. And it doesn't need to be this way. And it's, but it's where we are. Okay. So how to find a life of purpose and meaning without a paycheck or a pat on the back, right? <laughs> yeah. That's where you're now going into, you're this, you're going into this phase where not only do you have to figure out how to do this marriage and motherhood thing on top of figuring out how to do it, you have to be comfortable and in knowing that your rewards are going to be intrinsic and that they're going to be way down the line. They're not going to be today mm-hmm. or tomorrow. And you're it's, 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 it's feels self-defeating and that and yet nothing could be further than the truth, but that's what you're used to having spent 10 years in the workforce. And before you respond, I just want to read something really quick from an article that I just read the other day and from the BBC. Um, it's a long article, essentially. Well, it's, it's about quote unquote mater, maternal ambivalence. That's what they called it. But there's an example here of a, of a mom, 35, who said the following quote, when I became pregnant, I felt like I got downgraded from human to woman, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. Cause I think those are really sad. It's a profound statement. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, if she had said woman to mother, okay, but human to woman, that was pretty dramatic. The people I worked with, all they could talk to me about was that I was pregnant. It was the only thing about me. It became my whole personality. I hated that. And then she says the change to motherhood has been especially difficult after spending so much of her life developing her own career, social circle, and personal interests and aspirations, something that past generations of mothers who tended to become parents younger may not have experienced as fully. And that ironically is one of my arguments for getting married or getting married earlier rather than later, by the way, for this exact reason, to, so that you're not in this boat. So talk to us about what that's like to go from the paycheck and the pat on the back to this constant life of sacrifice. Yeah, it is hard. Um, I had my son when I was 30. So I guess now that's kind of considered young, which is kind of crazy. Um, it would have been so much easier if I would have had him when I was 25 because you know, Luke and I have talked about this substantially, but like where I was at in my career, I was making a lot of money. And so to step back from that, our lifestyle wasn't going to change drastically because Luke does well too, but I had to give up a lot of money. Um, and I had to give up. The main thing for me was pride because in my career, I had achieved the success that was tied to my identity. Um, and so it was like, oh my God, I'm like giving up who I am to be a mom. And I can relate to what that lady is saying, as sad as that is about um, being downgraded. What were, what were the words? Suzanne? Well, I get the, yeah, she said from human to woman. Now, yeah, because woman if you're a mother, I would get it, but that's kind of extreme to say that you're not looked at as a human just because you have a child. Well, I think what she means by that, and I can relate to this, is she means like in this feminist BS that we've been pushed on us for all these years. And especially if you are in the corporate world, it's just equal. Like you're equal to a man, especially if you're like making as much money as the men and you've achieved the same level of success. So she's saying I had achieved that. And now I'm actually, there's something that's differentiating me from a man now. Well, yeah, no crap. You know, yeah. man can't have a baby. So yep. Yep. I, I can relate to that um, feeling. Now I was it took me a while, but I, I did get excited about having my son. So I hope that she found that and didn't just see it as like this huge burden and this horrible thing. But it took me a while. It took me like six months to process being pregnant before I accepted like, I'm having a baby and this is a good thing. I'm excited. And that sounds, it's sad, you know, that I felt that way. But I think that probably a lot of women that were in my shoes did. Um, so if you do it younger, you're not as selfish and set in your ways and in your lifestyle. And you're not used to this, you know, bigger amount of money that you've amassed mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So also it's just easier physically on your body. If you do it younger, because you have more energy and you can bounce back quicker and lose the weight quicker. And all. there's so many reasons to do it while you're younger, but that's not um, encouraged anymore. So you don't see that as much, but the transition for me um, that was so difficult at first, like the first month or two, and it's still very difficult because this is all new to me. I just quit a couple months ago. Um, it's the appreciation and the words of affirmation. So for me, like I didn't care about the money I was making. Like I, that was great, you know, wonderful. But like I liked the success aspect of it and the acknowledgement of me doing a good job. And so when your husband comes home and he's exhausted and you know, he doesn't acknowledge the six loads of laundry that you've folded and done and the dinner that you've spent all these hours on, plus keeping the kids alive and trying to teach them something valuable and feed them and all the diapers. Like there's just no acknowledgement for any of that. And when you're used to, you know, clients or your boss or whoever patting your back all day long for doing a good job, that's really hard. Um, and then there's no paycheck to go with it either. So it's like, Okay, uh, this is hard. But one thing I will say, you made a comment that like, it takes a long time to see, I don't know what you said exactly, like the fruits That's of your labor, your labor or yeah. Um, for me, because I was absent for the three years, I have already started to see in just the few months that I've been home, little things that make it worth it for me. Like last night we were sitting on the couch and Mac like climbed into my lap and he was like, I love you, mom. It was like super cuddly and stuff. And he never used to do that with me before. <laughs> and so 
because like we're rebuilding this relationship and forming this bond, there are little moments where I'm like, okay, what I'm doing is making a difference. Um, and so you have to hang on to those because if, especially if you're not getting it from your husband, not that your husband has to like patch your back all day long or anything like that, but it's just hard when you're used to the appreciation in your job and you don't get it at home. That's and Luke, difficult. And Luke should do that. And we're going to, we're going to get on him on that one. Aren't we Liz? He's not terrible. Like I'm not saying he never says it. It's just not the equivalent of what I was receiving. No, as, well, no. And I, you yeah. know, I think, I think you're right to, to notice it more from, from your children. Cause that's really where it's going to come from that you'll notice it. And that's a perfect example. I'm so glad you, you, you brought that up because you just hit the nail on the head. That is the payment. Yeah. There's nothing like it. I mean, when he was crawling into your lap and you felt that for the first time, there's, there's no way you can tell me that that's not worth uh, anything else you could ever get from the, yeah. from, from the marketplace. Right. There's no amount of money or anything that I could get from my job that would replace that. And it's, um, it's also just like, I'm a Christian. And so I'm like, okay, this is God just humbling me. Like you don't need that money. Yeah. to show you that you're appreciated and that what you're doing matters. And so it's like, hmm, okay, God, you're right. <laughs> and Liz, you're going to get more and more and more of that. I mean, I'm just so excited to, to, to hear back from you in, in the, over the coming years, because it's just going to get better and better. I'm so super psyched for you. Yeah. I'm excited about it too. I just know it's, you got to put a lot of work in and you're not seeing it all the time. So it's like, I, oh. I try to remember those little one moments and hold on to them, especially on the really shitty days. <laughs> Good. Awesome. And another thing that people don't hear nearly enough of that I ran across the other day that I want to read from Yahoo um, about well, this example is Giada De Laurent. I, I never can say this right. Just the Food Network gal. De oh yeah, De Laurentiis. She's hot. I like her. Yeah. Um, so this article was all about, you know, you're just your typical media asking her, how do you do it? You have a child and you have this incredible career, which by the way, is like 0.2% of the careers that would exist for the average person. It's, it's definitely unique, but she was bold enough to say when asked about that, that it came at a cost. Good for her. She said, I was married quote for 12 years and I got divorced. It is definitely at a cost. And in the previous paragraph, she was talking about, she said, I mean, being a chef and having multiple restaurants, you don't have Christmas, you don't have the holidays. It's very difficult to raise a family and do all of that. She has one 14 year old daughter with her ex-husband. And I think that that is a, the, it is a critical message for which we are completely silent on. Because there are very few people who are willing to admit that behind what you see, and this leads really well into my next question, what behind what you think you see as being real is, is a shit show. It's an utter shit show and relationships are ruined and lives are destroyed and nobody wants to talk about it. Which brings mm -hmm. me to my question to ask about to you and that's social media. When I was your age, again, no social media didn't exist. So I'm curious um, I'm not really curious. I mean, I am curious for your particular example, because I'm aware of it, but it's always nice to hear from a, from someone who's dealing with it firsthand. What is social media like having that in your world with respect to everything we're talking about? What's that like? It's terrible. Um, I think that most people are smart enough to realize like, when you get on somebody's Instagram or whatever, like it's their highlight reel. So they know like life cannot be this beautiful vacation all the time. But I don't think people are humble enough to say looking at it all the time can't still help but impact the way that I think about myself and I think about life. So they can look at it on this like macro level, but I don't think they understand how much damage it's doing to them by looking at it all the time. So like not only if you take out all the Instagram models that have five filters on their face and all this plastic surgery and stuff and just leave that out of it and just say, okay, I'm only comparing myself to other moms here. 
there are not very many of them on there that are honest about the hard stuff in life. Like nobody wants to put that stuff on there. Everybody just wants to put on their pictures with their makeup and their kids and monogrammed outfits and stuff like that and pretend it's all good and dandy and it's not. Um, and then to be real frank about it, like the moms that are working full time, um, and trying to raise kids, they're definitely not going to put on there like, oh, I've had Uber Eats seven times this week. My kids have had no real nutrition. Uh, my husband and I hate each other and my kids are brats and, uh, I hate myself because everything sucks. Like nobody's saying that on social media and, Thankfully, you know, you, my mom, your generation didn't have to deal with that. And, you know, there are a few good things that come from it. Like, you know, I follow this toddler lady who has recipes on how to get kids to eat vegetables. Like, okay, yeah, that's one good thing or whatever. But that definitely doesn't make up for this self-doubt that it puts in your head and this comparison game that we play all the time. Um, And it also, I think for me, I've noticed that like, I was reading this thing the other day that said the human brain is not meant to know about every catastrophe that happens in the world. So oh. like, you know, we know yes. about every earthquake, every tsunami, every bombing, every, everything like that. It didn't, that wasn't how it used to be, you know, just 50 years ago, nobody knew all that stuff. Now we know all that, but also what to bring it to a parenting level. Now they have moms with so much anxiety because you think if you open up your door, your kid's getting kidnapped, raped, anything. Cause you see all these stories that I don't know if they're happening more, or we just know about more of them because we have all this information at our fingertips. But I feel like moms are afraid to let their kids live. It's like causing moms to be helicopter parents. And that's not good because kids need to explore and learn. And I'm not saying be negligent or not be around, but like, let them get hurt and things like that. And because you see like, Oh, well, this one kid got on a trampoline and then, you know, got brain damage from the rest of his life. These moms are like, I'm never going to let my kid get on a trampoline ever. And it's like, Oh my God, that was one in a million, but you're seeing that story. So it it's going to impact you. And that's what I hate about it is I feel like it's just adding all this stress and anxiety that is not necessary. And I don't see that the benefits are outweighing the negatives. I just don't see that at all. Couldn't agree more. And if anyone who uh, just heard that is interested, there's a great book called Free Range Kids. I don't know if you've heard of it. I haven't. Lenore, uh, can't remember the last name. I think it's Free Range Kids. Anyway, it's it, it, it's it's been out for a long time, but it's it's a great sort of counterbalance to the, what you just described. Yeah, I just I just think social media is just killing marriage and motherhood. I really do. I mean, it's killing just relationships in general and what they're supposed mm-hmm. to be like versus what they really are like. And there's just no surprise whatsoever that that we're struggling as much as we are. And, and I think a huge piece of that is social media, in addition to the larger uh, topic at hand, which is that that women are simply not raised to know how to be good wives and mothers. That's really what this comes down to, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's just I think so. Women aren't raised to be wives and mothers. They're raised to be men yep. their whole lives, uh, to, to emulate men's lives as though they are not, as though women are not demonstrably different from men. And this lie is screwing everything up in countless different ways. And the, the start of it the start, the beginning, the end, in my opinion, is the wrong priorities in life. That's what it comes down to. This is what I espouse is that if you, it's all about having raised your daughters in particular to do everything backwards. That's my argument. Yeah. Which is why I wanted to read this paragraph. Go ahead. You're going to say something from I was just going to say, also, I think that one of the biggest damaging things that it's done is it tells moms that motherhood is not important. Yes. And it's one of the most important yeah, things I mean, in life. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's what I mean by the prioritizing is so screwed up because it it sends a message that that it's second to this other thing. And, and if you just simply prior, prioritize everything properly, women wouldn't be in this boat. So so in Beyond Order, Jordan Peterson's book, he um, talked about this exact thing that and he named, quote unquote, if you want a radically successful life, quote unquote, your, the order that you would do that in would be marriage, children, career or job, and then noting that most people have jobs, not careers. That's an important point. And then your leisure time. 
So that was an interesting way of putting it. And I'm going to read um, something from this book because I just read it the other day and I thought, oh, this is perfect for what we're going to be talking about. And um, since he's so eloquent, I'll just read it. He writes, no one will speak the truth about this. To note outright that we lie to young women in particular about what they are most likely to want in life is taboo in our culture. With its incomprehensibly strange insistence that the primary satisfaction in the typical person's life is to be found in career, a rarity in itself, as most people have jobs, not careers. But it is an uncommon woman in my clinical and general professional experience, regardless of brilliance or talent, training, discipline, parental desire, youthful delusion, or cultural brainwashing, who would not perform whatever sacrifice necessary to bring a child into the world by the time she is 29 or 35 or worse, 40. Meaning, obviously, that we're just doing it all backwards. That's all there is to it. The priorities are messed up. The values are messed up. The messaging is messed up. This is what's causing women to be in your boat. I 100% agree. And I think that I there's been a big shift um, between your generation and my generation. I, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. With your generation, I feel like you all knew and expected and just accepted that it was part of life. Like I'm going to have kids and a family and my generation, if you talk to these college girls, cause I have them, the babysit for me, they're like, I might get married. I might have kids. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to change your tune when you're 30 and your internal clock starts ticking. But like, it's a different expectation now than it used to be. Then it's been for you know all of history. And so that's very sad to me because by the time that that clock does start ticking inside of them, they're like, oh yeah, I actually do want kids in a family. They're old, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's a problem. That's, that's exactly my point. That that's the wrong time to be doing it. And so that's why we're in such trouble. We really are. Um, I truly believe that the only answer personally, because you're never going to get it from the government, that's for sure. And from culture um, is parenting. I agree with you. And to add to that, I do think that there's, there's gotta be some element of mentorship. I think that this used to exist more so in the church and that's kind of fallen apart in our society. But I think, you know, for some reason, women, they either have like an excellent relationship with their mom or not so excellent, but like it used to be that they would get a lot of this mentorship and training and advice from their mothers. And that seems to have gone away. And so there has got to be some form of, you know, people doing like you've done with me, it's got to be on a bigger scale. Otherwise these girls are just going to flounder through life and either eventually have kids and have to deal with all the consequences like I'm dealing with, or, you know, wait too long. And then it's too late And they're going to be saying like I did, why didn't somebody warn me? But the next step is then, okay, if I want to write this ship, how do I do it the right way? It's not just going to be like reading a bunch of articles and watching a bunch of YouTube videos. There has to be some relational aspect with examples of this is what you do in this situation. If your kid's being a brat, (laughs) like it's, you know, you can't watch a YouTube video to figure that out, you know? Well, and it's funny that you say that because that's, um, (laughs) um, that's kind of what I want this this podcast to go forward in being, because I, you know it's one thing to read a book, um, and it's another thing to have it talked to you like you're saying. Like it's almost like the coaching that I do behind the scenes. I want out front and center, and not just about marriage, but also parenting. And I, in the same way, people look up on YouTube about how to do you know how to fix a car. Why not look up how to raise your kid? I mean, are there really videos out there? Um, that are useful and countercultural in that way. I don't know, but um, that's, that's kind of the plan here. And of course, that's just, that's just little me, but I mean, in a larger sense, I think, and I hope that it will start to change with the younger set that at the very least, they're going to be doing it differently with their own kids. Now that will take a long time to sort of plan, play, play itself out, but um, you know, it's something. And I think your podcast I mean, the, the being different podcast, do you want to talk about that for a minute 
and just say sure. how that came to be and um and encourage people to go over there. Yeah, I um when I was leaving my job or before I left my job actually, I decided to do it. Um I knew nothing about podcasting world. I still know very little about it. I'm just learning slowly. Um but I was I felt isolated. And I think that's one other thing with social media that it like gives you this false illusion that you have access to all these people and that you're friends with all these people, but you're not, Mm -hmm. you're really just become more, you know, introverted and, you know, Mm -hmm. withdrawn from society. And so I felt very alone. Like surely I can't be the only person who feels like I suck at mothering and everything right now. Like I can't be alone. And so the podcast for me was just like, okay, well, if I'm not going to be working, I need like some creative outlet to do something, but I also want to keep learning things. And it gives you like for a procrastinator like me deadlines, but it also gives you like, okay, you have got to find somebody to talk to and learn something from. So for me, it's like an educational component. And I was like, well, why don't I share this? Like I can share the big fuck ups in life that I'm making. And hopefully people can learn from those. And I can also share the good information from people that have done things right. Um, And it's just, it is going to be different um, because people don't like to talk about these things, but, and especially my generation, because we live in this Instagram world where everything has to be perfect. I think that you've got to have more of these real conversations that people can hear so that they don't feel alone, but they know that you don't have to do things the way, do things the way society says you have to, you can be different and that's okay. Amen. In fact, you should be different if you want to be successful. <laughs> that's yes, how, I agree. That's, that's how you're good. That's how you're going to get there. Oh my gosh. Well, this has been awesome, Liz. I'm so glad you came on and talked to me. You know, we're going to talk again. I know we are. Our podcasts are too similar to not to overlap again. And um, I thank you very much for, for coming on and talking and for just being so genuine. It's, it's really, really rare and I love it. And um, I can't thank you enough. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for doing what you're doing. You have played a very impactful part in my life of changing things and deciding to leave my career and do what I'm doing now. And not just through the coaching, but I randomly found your uh, book, the flip side to feminism one night when I was just like doom scrolling on like, how do I get myself out of this disaster that I'm in? And that's how I found you. And I was like, she's right about so many things. And I found your podcast and I was like, okay, like here's some validation that there's somebody who's older in me than in life that's saying you don't have to do things the way society says. And I think there's just got to be more people out there that are willing to say it. Well, maybe there will be, but uh, for now it might be you and me alone for a while. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> okay, hon. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Bye. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker Show. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. <laughs>